Before the pandemic, Massachusetts was struggling with a gap between population growth and housing supply, along with a persistent gap in affordability. One effort to overcome that is a new group that's going to be called Housing Forward Massachusetts. We'd like to welcome its executive director and former Boston City Councilor, Josh Zakem. Thank you very much for being with us, Josh. Oh, thanks for having me, Chris. It's good to, I would say, be here again, but it's good talking to you again. Josh, you're, you're putting together this group with uh, some familiar names. I certainly Barry Bluestone has done a lot of research on housing supply and housing access. Uh, but what about the mission here about the importance of information? Sure. You know, when I was uh, in my role in the Boston City Council, where for a time I chaired our housing committee, um, there, I noticed, um, and it's not just Boston specific, it's across the state, a real lack of data uh, and research behind some of the decisions that were being made behind some of the advocacy we were hearing from neighborhood groups, from developers on whether a project should or should not happen. And I think it's really, really important. We're talking about solving an economic problem here, which is the lack of affordable middle-income housing in the Commonwealth. We need to look at what's worked in other communities. And almost never has it been restricting supply. It's been about making it easier, uh, quicker, and consequently costing less for people to build housing. And uh, we need to do that in Massachusetts. The numbers are stark. The number of folks that have come to Massachusetts, the job growth over the years has far outstripped housing supply. And like I said, this isn't just a Boston problem. This is an issue in our inner suburbs, throughout Metro West uh, and across the state. And there's a real opportunity, I think, to jump on this moment in time where people care about economic and social justice, about climate change, uh, to make some of these changes. Well, uh, I know this is hardly news to us, maybe, but uh, maybe you can remind some of our viewers, what about the gap between uh, the level of new supply that we see here in Boston and what we see in some of the surrounding communities? Um, you know, just to use one example, Framingham, uh, over their mayor's veto, I, I'll give, I want to give her credit for vetoing it, passed, the Framingham City Council passed a moratorium on all multifamily development for nine months. Um, that is, you know, that makes it a challenge uh, to grow. And I understand local communities and I was a district city councilor. I know how important neighborhood input is. I know how important it is for people to feel that they have a say in their communities and they absolutely should continue to do that. But we need to remove some of these unnecessary and outdated obstacles to it. You know, moratoriums don't work. Uh, the governor, Governor Baker has a great bill at the state house right now. It's in conference committee, the housing choice bill that would change the rules for zoning changes in Massachusetts from a two thirds vote, which is what's currently needed to a simple majority vote. That shouldn't be too controversial. If a community wants to make some of these changes, wants to let's say, allow more development, you know, more dense development around their transit hubs, um, they should be able to do that and they shouldn't need a super majority to do it. When you look at some of the data about what is making our communities more segregated, what are obstacles to opportunity in our public education, system. Um, a lot of it is these exclusionary zoning rules, which need to be updated, need to be changed, and we need to do it right now so that when we want to say we want to be a greener community, which means more transit-oriented development, more denser development, we want to be a more equitable community, which means allowing folks with different income levels, often from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, to be in some of our communities. We need to make these changes now. Well, one thing I think that uh, suburban communities have in common, even with Boston, is that when, when you get to the level of a neighborhood association trying to weigh in on a zoning decision, uh, you end up with a lot of homeowners being represented. And they should be, but, but at the same time, they're usually more resistant to, to density. So uh, uh, w what about that in the suburbs? Uh, I mean, is, is it still democratic to sort of uh, cut back on some of that influence? Listen, I, I think the, the civic association, neighborhood groups have an important role and a constructive role to play. But if you look at the data, and I believe it's BU that recently had a study on this, the demographics of those groups, and it falls through to who shows up at zoning meetings or community meetings or city council meetings, is overwhelmingly whiter and wealthier and older than the community at large. Uh, there's a host of systemic reasons for that. But one of the things that Housing Forward is offering in our first uh, virtual training session is on November 17th, is called Advocacy for All. It's we want to demystify this process for folks who may be new to a community or may have lived there a while, but aren't members of the neighborhood association, but they still want to feel empowered to speak up. Now, for you or I, the people who are regulars, so to speak, at these, it's no big deal to get up at a public meeting and speak your mind. But for others, um, they may not have that, the skill set or the confidence, so we're providing them with the tools on how to find out where 
these decisions are being made, what officials are making those decisions, and then how to craft a message, how to organize your neighbors. Um, and these will be free, open to all these training sessions. And I think there's a real pool of folks out there who just don't feel empowered to speak up in these communities. By the way, how, how do you see uh, the pandemic uh, influencing the mission of your, your, your new organization? Because right now we have a crisis. We have people uh, who, who could be getting evicted in large numbers pretty soon. Uh, they need places to go. Um, how do they fit into what you're trying to do? Well, listen, the economic devastation of this pandemic has just you know, exacerbated the housing shortage in Massachusetts. A lot of the data we're looking at and we've been seeing, and I'm not, you know, this has been widely reported, is that overcrowding due to high cost has been one of the biggest um, indicators uh, of, of contagion. It's one, one of the best, best things you can look at um, in these some more densely populated cities where families are sharing a bedroom or doubling and tripling up. So, you know, there's no immediate solution on that, but I do think our long-term goals are to ameliorate that situation. Uh, in the short term, I've just been seeing from people we've been talking to, elected officials, activists, uh, people in the real estate industry, nonprofit community, really standing together though on this issue, whether it's you know landlords, um, property owners who are saying, I'm not planning to evict anyone. I don't want to put people out in the street right now. Whether it's elected officials who are scrambling and working really hard to get more resources for rental assistance, uh, for, tra for jobs training to help people get through this. Um, I would say it's encouraging. Uh, obviously the pandemic has wrought havoc uh, across every aspect of our lives. So um, we are, cognizant of that, but it's important that if we want Massachusetts to come out of this stronger, we need to be thinking ahead. And if we're talking about now this remote work, uh, even when we're all able to be back in an office, if someone can work in a job that's based in Boston and they're living in Austin uh, or they're living in Utah or wherever else, um, that could hurt our economy. That's going to hurt the ability of Boston companies to grow here. Um, if they can't find affordable middle income housing for their employees. And that's an old story, but I think it's even more important now. Uh, what about selling this in this area? Because uh, I've seen cases where there are people who might be generally sympathetic to more housing and more affordability. But as soon as you say, let's, let's put up a, some dense market housing in, in Newton is saying, well, that's not really going to help the poor people. So uh, why should we permit that? Yeah. Well, that's the, uh, that's the traditional discussion. And that's what we're looking to change. Um, you know, obviously we need more workforce in middle income housing and low income housing as well. And I am absolutely hopeful that we will have a change in Washington next year that will bring a lot more resources towards that. But in the meantime, without significant federal investment in low income and affordable housing, we need to be looking at increasing the supply. And you look at the studies that have been over and over again, that market rate housing does not accelerate displacement, does not actually end up raising rent. It often goes to where demand already is. And this is something that uh, Barry Bluestone, our uh, formerly of Northeastern, our board president, has often talked about, that you need different types of housing for people at different stages of their lives. Um, that, you know, as families are growing, they need larger spaces and they want to be able to do that. And it should be near transit, near work, near other resources and amenities. Um, but people cycle through this over and over. So there's a place uh, for family-sized units. There's a place for single-family homes, of course, but when we're talking about and Newton, where I grew up, wonderful community, um, has a lot of good transit, both commuter rail and green line transit, as well as express bus stops. And we really need to be thinking about, and I want to credit Newton actually, they've really started looking at this seriously, about upzoning in those areas. I think every community, and there's no one size fits all approach, but every community should be looking at opportunities for upzoning. And I don't mean building a skyscraper. I'm talking about three, four, five stories, uh, of various sized apartments that are typically going to be lower cost than the large single family homes in many of these communities. But also when we talk about climate change, if they're near transit, people are going to take transit. If there are denser buildings, multifamily units uh, just themselves give off far fewer carbon emissions than single family homes, regardless of how efficient your appliances are and your heating system is. So there's a lot that can be done here. Um, and I think long term, as we were able to empower folks who feel excuse me, empower people to feel similarly, uh, we're going to have an impact across the Commonwealth. Eight months ago, it was pretty common to get up in the morning, turn on the TV and hear about a lot of traffic congestion. That hasn't happened very much lately, but um, beyond the pandemic, uh, what do you see? Sure. I mean, listen, this is once in a, what, four or five generation uh, catastrophe. So there's not much to compare it to, but you look back to the closest 
analog is probably the 1918 uh, flu pandemic and cities came back. People have a natural desire to, I think, be together, whether that's at restaurants, whether it's walking in their community, whether it's going to a park. Um, so I think cities are gonna recover, whether that's in 12 months or 36 months or longer is, is a different question. Um, but also for so many of the industries that have driven the Boston and the Massachusetts economy, it's about collaboration. And while you know Zoom and video conferencing and phones and email are important tools that are helping us get through this, it's no substitute for human interaction. It's not a substitute for two graduate students at MIT getting together over a beer in Kendall Square and, and thinking about the next big idea. Um, so I think we're gonna see that certainly in our creative and life sciences industries and our colleges and universities. And that's what drives our regional economy. So I'm an eternal optimist. We're going through incredibly tough times right now. But, you know, if we're talking, you know, a year, two, three years from now, I think we'll be back. Well, speaking of ideas, uh, you have some of those on your website, people putting out these occasional papers. So if people want to keep up with that, uh, how can they find it? Yeah, please check us out, housingforwardma.org. Um, we're also on Twitter, Facebook. And as I mentioned, our first uh, virtual training session is going to be November 17th. That'll be up on the website as well about being an advocate, crafting a message for public meetings and public officials. And, you know, it's free to all. And we want to be a resource for individuals, organizations, policymakers uh, to make these changes in the Commonwealth. Thank you very much for joining us and taking the time. Thanks for having me, Chris. Good. Josh Sikkim from Housing Forward MA. We'll have more news in just a moment.